Let me welcome the next speaker, Matthew Trenish. He uh, did a keynote on uh, quantum computing, and he works for IBM um, on uh, QIS kit on quantum computing as a senior research engineer. A big round of applause. Over to Matthew. Thanks for that introduction. So. Um, Today I'm trying to run a workshop on getting started with quantum information theory and quantum computing using the QuizKit SDK. Um, this presentation is a I've got a mix of little slides with some diagrams in it, but most of it is going to be in a Jupyter notebook. Um, if you click that, if you go to that link there, um, which is just my GitHub QuizKit dash workshop, um, there are some links. You can all you need is a web browser to run this. Um, there's a link off the README if people want to follow along. Or if you happen to have Jupyter Notebook and Python 3 installed locally, you can also run it locally on your laptop instead of a web-hosted version. Um, I also believe I have the link in the notebook, but I figured that, that is a much shorter link. So um, I'm going to leave this up on the screen for a bit. I don't know who wants to follow along with me on their laptop. Yes? Yes, this is, a, this is the GitHub repo. You can clone it. Um, and in the README and further down, there's a link to, I think, the service is Google Collab. It's Google's hosted Jupyter Notebook environment, so you don't need to run anything locally. Um, so if people want to follow along now, they're more than welcome to. Um, I only see four people with their laptop out, so that's fine. Um, but if, if are the people who do have their laptops out intending to follow along, I can wait for you to get everything set up, or we can... I can just dive into it. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? No, my Git is not, not configured yet. OK. Well, uh, you, well, that's the thing is you just go to that link, and there's another link on the README to just run it on a web browser. You don't need, Git lo you don't need anything local. You just need a Google account if you want to. Um... Yeah, yeah, I can, there's, there's no rush. Um, and I realize my name is very difficult to spell, so. Wish there was a good format to send this out ahead of time. People good or need to keep waiting? OK. Um, so the first thing you need to do, um, these are just the instructions I was talking about before. That's the longer link to Google Collab. But if you go to the shorter link, it links there as well. Um, the first thing you need to do is, if you're running in Google Collab or you've never used QuizKit before, is to install it. If you just uncomment that first uh, pound sign and run this command uh, with Shift Enter, it will install QuizKit locally. Um, and uh, I don't need to do that because obviously I have it installed uh, locally. But also, while people are installing it, it takes a few seconds to pull from the internet. Um, I just thought I'd give a little background on what QuizKit is before we move along. For those who might not have been in uh, my presentation yesterday as well, these slides are exactly the same. Um, so QuizKit is an SDK for dealing with what are called NISC devices or NISC computers, which is, just means uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers. Those are quantum computers that exist today and in the near future, like the next decade or so. Um, where they have a small number of qubits, like around 100 or less, maybe a little more, and they're not fault tolerant, which means that noise and errors um, affect their operation. Um, it's an Apache 2 licensed project, and it's designed to be back-end agnostic. While 
It does include out-of-the-box support for IBM's quantum devices and some local simulators that are packaged with it. Um, it's written in a way that if you have your own quantum devices or your own simulators, it's easily adaptable. It designs abstract frameworks for dealing with quantum computation. Um, and like a lot of, well, that's completely illegible. I apologize. <laughs> um, like a lot of open source projects, it's made up of different components. In QuizKit, they're all named after the classical elements. So in the center there, we have the Terra component, which is the base. It's a Python interface to interface software with um, hardware. So it lets you interact with quantum, actual quantum devices or simulators. Um, and that's the one we'll actually be spending most of the time with today. Um, then there's the Air component, which is a high-performance C++ simulator for, that also supports noise modeling. Um, on the top, there's the Aqua component, which um, for typical software development is the one most people will probably be interested in. It provides a Python library interface, so you can just call a Python library, you give it data, and it will do the quantum operations under the covers and give you a result back. Um, and then there's the Ignis component, which, as I said, uh, the current quantum computers and the, the ones that QuizKit is designed to work with are not no, uh, fault tolerant and have a lot of noise. Ignis project is there to help deal with that noise. It lets you characterize it and try to do statistical mitigation techniques. Um, and the component we're going to be spending most of the time on today in this workshop is called Terra, um, which is the base layer for um, interfacing software with the quantum devices. It provides an SDK for um, writing quantum circuits. It's like a DSL in Python that lets you define a quantum circuit and build it up, and then you can send that to a device, you can, you can draw it, you can do all sorts of things with it. Um, and then it also lets you um, compile those circuits. Each quantum device has its own characteristics, certain ways the qubits are aligned, um, and other things that you need to factor in when you're trying to run a circuit on a quantum device. And Terra will um, compile those circuits so it will run on the actual device and hopefully do it efficiently. And it, it's written in Python. Um, oops. Um, so assuming everyone was able to do the first step and install QuizKit without an error, um, is that good for people who are following along? I don't know how many are. Um, the next step is to just check it um, by just running this one, and it imports the version. Um, the next thing people will want to do, um, potentially, is sign, oh, this is, the resolution is so low it's hard to read, um, is to sign up for the quantum experience. This enables you to um, get an account and submit jobs to the publicly accessible IBM quantum computers. You don't actually need to make a separate account. There's a single sign-on. If you just click that link, and you'll see this is a picture of what it looks like. You can make an account, or what I actually do, and I work for IBM, but I just click the GitHub link, and it just works. Um, so you get an account from that. And once you make an account, you can click that link to get credentials. Um, and once you get credentials, then we can continue. Um, I'm going to run this because it takes a little bit of time with the network traffic. But since I already have credentials um, saved, I don't need to do this step. But if you do, you just want to comment out this line and follow the text that I wrote in the notebook. And you copy the API token from the instructions, and you put it in that string where it says my API token. And that will, um, that will work. But since I have mine saved locally already, I can just run this. And it's going to list the quantum computers I have access to, um, which in this case, there are three of them, two five bit quantum computers, which are QX4 and QX2, and then one 14 qubit um, device, which is misleadingly labeled 16, because... Uh, physically exist? All three of them are in Yorktown Heights, New York, at the IBM Research Lab there. Okay, so we need we are going to connect it to remo rem remotely, or uh, yes. we are so going to run it, in a simulator. It's, it's all well, so the workshop is all going to be run locally on the simulator for time because there are three quantum computers and however many people sitting here trying to run jobs on them, and there's also everyone in the world has access to them. Um, but it's just there's an, a, a unified API interface, so it's like a cloud API, and you submit your jobs to it, and then it's like a like an old school HPC cluster where it's shared time batching. Um, okay. 
So, uh, but we have access to the Q4, Q2, and Q16, uh, qubit 16 machine. Yeah, so you have access to all of these. The Q16 is actually a 14 qubit computer, not 16, because two of the qubits failed. Um, <laughs> so they uh, just disabled them. But um, the, yeah, and so you can, we're, um, for the workshop, we're going to be running everything locally on a local simulator, or if you're using Google Collab, you'll be using it on Google's computer, and that's just for time reasons. Um, I believe um, if I scroll down, I think I put it, yeah, um, right there I say, so in, in the workshop, if you're following along, there are these backend sim strings, which uh, is the variable I use for the local simulator. If you just replace backend sim with backend, it will run on one of the quantum devices, um, which is something I do in a second. Um, are there any other questions before I move on? Yeah. So what you're saying is it's some kind of grid. Some kind of grid? Some kind of grid. That means you have three computers in the back end, but uh, yeah. you can end up in any one of them. Oh, no, you uh, specifically pick which one. Um, because there are, they all behave differently because they're all noisy. Um, so they're, they have individual characteristics that um, you have to build the circuits for, which is what I was saying Terra does during the compilation step. Um, so you, you pick the specific one you want to run on, which is going to be two or three lines down. Um, so let me, uh, um, let me just run this one and it'll give you a better picture. Um, once the network traffic is fun. This is why, by the way, this is why we do everything on the local simulator for this workshop, because if everyone has to wait for the network to, and this is just querying the devices to get their information. Uh, we're not actually submitting the job, I'm just asking all three devices, what, what are your characteristics? What are your backend properties? Um, and this is the fun part where we wait. Okay, there we go. Oh, and this is gonna be really fun with the, 1024 by 768. Um, so this is the 14 qubit one, and that's called, this is, <laughs> um, that's called the coupling map, which shows the relationship between qubits that you can run multiple operations on. So each dot is a qubit, and then the line between them means there's a, a way to run a two qubit operation on them. So you can run, like, be, um, anywhere there's a line, you can run between those two nodes. And then you can see there are 14 qubits, there are, it says there are zero jobs, I think the network is running late, and then um, it's the least busy, and it's operational. And then these T1 and T2 are time parameters for decoherence. They're two different ways that your quantum state decays, and those are the times you have until that happens on average between all of the qubits, which is not very long if, you know, 56 microseconds is not that long. But then we can compare it to another one, um, which in this case is IBM QX2, which is a five qubit device. And you can see the coupling map is very different. Um, the number of qubits is very different. And um, all of the parameters are also different. And then the other thing, the other backend characteristic I wanted to show was um, this one. And so we're gonna sit here and wait for the HTTP traffic to go back and forth again. And this shows the, this is going to show the details on the IBM QX2 device, um, which, I, was that the one I just showed? They're very similar in this level, yeah. So IBM QX2 is the one on the screen right now. And then QX4 is just the other five qubit one. Um, and it looks very similar, but the time parameters are different. And here we can see the um, QX2. Um, so we can see more details here. So we can see that there are certain types of quantum gates that run on it, which is something we'll be talking about in a minute. Um, it says it's not a simulator. It has a, a list representation of that graph, uh, the number of executions you can run in a single job, things like that. But then there are more, more details. So we can see the individual error rates for each qubit and the coherence time parameters um, for each of them. Um, and we can see the error rates, this resolution makes, it's a very low resolution projector, um, so it's all overlapping. But on that one, you can see the um, error rates for two qubit operations, which is something we'll also be talking about. Um, and then here's an error map where you can see the um, error rates for the qubits 
relative to the coupling map, which actually helps you figure out how, when you're going to run something on this, which qubit you want to pick. Um, and then the job history is just the amount of jobs I've run on this in the past. Um, so that was just the, the back end aside and to give people some time to sign up for the quantum experience if they wanted to. Because the real fun of this is not to play around with it in a simulator, but it's actually experiment with the real devices. Um, and I wanted to, um, so the bulk of the time in the workshop is going to be on showing the basic concepts of quantum information theory through QuizKit and in Python code in this workshop. But before I got into that, I wanted to show the slides again from my presentation yesterday because it's very graphical and it helps people think about um, what a qubit is and we'll try to relate to this. So the easiest way to think about a qubit is with the block sphere, which is that sphere right there. It's a, um, and you can think of the, quanta, the state of a qubit at any time as that orange vector, and it can be anywhere on the surface of the sphere. So you, and when you perform operations on a qubit, you're just moving that vector to a different position on the sphere. Um, and just like a classical bit, it can be at the zero state or the one state. And you don't really have to worry too much about that notation. You, the, uh, it's called bracket notation, and in this, in this, it just means it's a vector, which it is because it's pointing up or down. Um, and when you're ready to read the value out of a qubit, that's called measurement, and you'll get a zero or a one. And what will happen is it will collapse up or down. So if it collapses up, it's gonna be a zero, and if it collapses down, it's going to be a one. And um, this measurement is irreversible. So you can have that, that arrow pointing anywhere along the surface of the sphere, but when you measure, you get a zero or a one out, and that's the only information you'll get out of the system. Um, and you perform operations on a qubit um, by using quantum logic gates, which I talked about before. There are a lot of different logic gates. They do all different types of rotations. Um, the example I have there is called the X gate or the quantum knot gate, and it's the most simple one. Um, and it's just a, you can think of it as a 180 degree rotation around the X axis. So in this example, if you start at the basis state zero, which a freshly initialized qubit always starts at that zero, thinks it's the ground state, when if you run an X gate on that, it just becomes a one because it rotates over the X axis and points down. Um, two things to keep in mind with quantum logic gates though is that they're reversible, um, and, which means you can go either way, and they're also represented by unitary matrices which is a special type of matrix if you're not familiar with linear algebra. It's, you can read the Wikipedia page on it. Um, but I mention that because all quantum logic gates are represented by unitary matrices and all operations are matrix multiplication. So you have a vector for your quantum state with all of your qubits and you multiply it by this unitary matrix and you get your output vector state. Um, and that's the most common way that people actually represent these logic gates. They don't draw these spheres and rotate with arrows. They just do a matrix multiplication. Um, so now we can see this in practice. So the first thing we can do in QuizKit is this, this line here, which just gives us the simulator. We're just setting that up. But we can build a quantum circuit and a very simple one at that. So this first one is just going to give us one qubit and then one classical register to store it, which are these two lines here. So we say, give us a quantum register with one qubit and assign it to the variable Q. And then we do one classical register, one classical register with one classical bit, and we label that C. We define a circuit with Q and C for the quantum register and the classical register, and we just measure. We run that operation, and what we're expecting is because it's a fresh qubit and we're not performing any, we're not running any logic gates on it, it should always be at that zero basis state, which is represented, this doesn't even fit on the, the uh, resolution. So we can execute this circuit and then look at the amount of results we get. Um, so we always get a zero. We run this circuit um, 1,024 times because um, Quanta qubits are probabilistic, so they can behave randomly, and that's expected. But there's also noise in a real quantum computer, and we want to um, account for that by running things multiple times 
to so we can look at the statistics over time, even if we encounter an individual error. So whenever we do execution, we'll see um, numbers, uh, numbers like this. And I think for this workshop, I do all 1,024 and maybe 100 in a few spots, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and then we can also graph it, um, because everyone likes pretty pictures. And in this case, it's 100% of the time we get a zero. Um, and then we can look at the quantum knot gate, which was that first gate that I showed. Um, and in this case, we do the same setup. So we get a quantum register with one qubit, um, a classical register with one classical bit to store the result, the zero or the one on the output. And then we define a circuit with those. And then in QuizKit, the way you run the X gate is you just apply, the, you just run the method X on the quantum circuit object, like right there. And we say we're gonna run that on quantum register bit zero, and then measure. And then we're gonna draw that circuit to see what it looks like, um, the, the, the actual circuit representation, which is just X gate on qubit zero, and then measure. Um, are people able to follow along? Is this also legible? Okay. Um, and then what we're expecting, like before, um, is to always get a one instead of a zero because we apply that X gate. So this is the, just the qubit for that. And the same thing before, we're going to execute on the backend simulator. And in this case, we're only running it 100 times. These circuits are so small, it doesn't really make a difference because things are gonna be fast. And then we're gonna just gonna print the counts. And here we get um, one 100 times, 100% 100 because we get it 100 times. And then we can also graph that. Um, and we get um, one 100% of the time. This is really low resolution. Um, so, um, there are, the, the next thing we're gonna talk about is called superposition, but before we get into the details on that, I just wanted to mention there are two fundamental properties to quantum mechanics and quantum computation that really give you, which are going to be basically all I cover in this workshop, but it should give you a basis to understand why quantum computing is different. And, um, and those are superposition and entanglement. And if you look at them, uh, superposition is the property that a physical system in a definite state can behave randomly. Um, in the case of quantum computation, it means you can prepare a qubit identically, and even though it's identically prepared, it will give you a random result. Um, the second one is a little bit more abstract, and that's called entanglement. And that's um, uh, two systems that are too far apart to influence each other um, can still behave in a way that, while individually random, are correlated. And I know that's a little weird to think about, and hopefully later in the workshop, I'll be able to demonstrate that a little bit more clearly. But it's these two properties that um, really make quantum computing special uh, because it's relying on these quantum mechanical effects. And the first one we're gonna talk about is superposition because it's a little bit easier to wrap your head around. Um, people have probably heard of Schrodinger's cat, you know, the, cla the classical thought experiment where you have a cat in a box with poison in a vial that's on a time delay to open, you don't know when. And when the cat's in the box, you can think of it as alive and dead at the same time. And you don't know until you look at it whether it is alive or dead. Um, when you look at it from quantum computing, it's the same thing, but a little bit less morbid, I guess. Um, so in this case, we've talked about the zero basis state and the one basis state, the zero and one. But what happens when the qubit, that vector is pointing anywhere else in between them? Uh, the system can be thought of as being both a zero and a one at the same time because you'll only get the zero or the one on the output. Um, I personally like to think of it more as just a probability thing. So the vector is pointing to x plus one, it's halfway between one and zero, and when you measure, you'll get a 50-50 chance of it being a zero or a one. If it's a little bit closer to zero, your probability will go up that it's going to be a zero, and if it's pointing a little bit down, it'll, probability will go up to be a one. Um, and just like, um, 
the X gate for doing a quantum knot, there's a quantum logic gate called the Hadamard, which is used for putting things in superposition. Um, and you can think of the Hadamard as a rotation over the X plus Z axis, which is just that diagonal right there. Um, so if you're at the basis state zero and you apply a Hadamard, it'll go down to um, that plus one X, and that's that superposition state where it's a 50-50. Um, so we can build this in QuizKit the same way. So just like before, we're going to build a quantum register with one qubit, a classical register with one classical bit for the result, build a circuit with those, apply a Hadamard, and then measure. And then we can draw that circuit and see what it looks like. And just like before, it's the same thing, but instead of an X gate, we have an H gate. So we apply an H gate and we measure. Um, and then we're going to um, execute this 100 times and print the output. And it's behaving randomly. You, we have a 50-50 50 50 chance of it being one or zero, and that's more or less what we get because random doesn't mean perfectly distributed. So it's about a 50-50 split between a one and a zero, which is what we expect when we measure in that superposition state. We can also graph that because graphs are easier to read. So here we had a 60-40 split, which is pretty much exactly what we expected. But things are um, a little bit interesting when we start looking at um, the phase component. So the Hadamard is its own inverse. Um, so if you apply a Hadamard twice, it goes back to the state it was in originally, um, assuming it's along that basis state. So if we start at zero, we apply a Hadamard, it goes to that plus x, and if we apply it again, it'll just rotate back up to zero. Um, and the same is true for when we're at one. If we're pointing down at one and we go, we apply a Hadamard, it will go to minus x instead of plus x. Or you can think of that as zero minus one as opposed to zero plus one, because the phase is different. That little red thing there is the phase. Um, and so while the Hadamard lets you put things in superposition, it also lets you look at the phase. Because if you apply this rotation, you can look at the phase component of something, and it's just rotating it um, along that basis state, that z-axis, which is where we're measuring from. Um, and that's pretty useful. But we can also demonstrate this uh, in QuizKit um, the same way. So in here, in this case, we're building the same quantum circuit again from one quantum register, one qubit and one classical bit, and we just apply a Hadamard twice. And we measure it, and our gate looks like that. And we then we execute it. We get um, zero 100% of the time like we expect, and we just graph that. And the same is true if we put things in um, from starting from the, ba the one basis state. So we, put it, we apply an X gate to go from zero to one. Then we apply a Hadamard twice, and we measure, and we should get one 100% of the time. And we do, and we can graph that. We get one 100% of the time. Um, before I move on, are there any questions? Because that's, is, are people able to follow me? Am I moving too quickly? Any clarification on things? Sorry, what was that? How did we get 100% probability of one this time? Um, so this time we were doing the, so we started in the one basis state. So we started by applying an X gate and it pointed down to one. And then we applied a Hadamard, so it went to negative one. And like I said, the Hadamard, because of the phase, is its own inverse. So when it's at negative one, we rotate over the z plus x axis, and it goes back down to one. Um, so that's what I was showing there in the circuit, uh, was that it goes from uh, zero minus one or the minus x position, and then it goes back down to one. Does that answer your question? A general query uh, in the representation of qubits, like uh, the value of the qubit change when we observe it, uh, 
value may be zero or one, right? Uh, yes. So when we when we measure and observe it, we get a zero or a one output, and that's because it's collapsing. We can't look at the sphere. Um, from it's it's not actually a sphere, but from the logical perspective, we can't look at the position along the sphere. When we want to look at the qubit, we either get a zero or a one because that vector will move up or down. Yeah, either um, either it can spin up or spin down. Uh, yeah. So it is a probability. So, but how uh, these qubits can be used to represent data because uh, the value uh, depends while we observe uh, the value changes. So yeah. how it can be used to represent the data? Um, well, I mean, you get a zero or a one output, so yeah. you could think of it as a bit string of the number of qubits long, or you can um, use um, some other tricks to use data out. I actually. Uh, to, uh, which algorithm am I using? Well, I'm not specifically talking about any algorithms yet. I'm still just looking at the basics of how qubits, how you interact with qubits. I'm dealing at a level below algorithms to give some fundamentals. Um, in the presentation yesterday, I used an algorithm called bernstein vazirani which was looking at, um, it's an oracle problem. Um, and I think that was recorded, and we can look at that then. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, Bernstein Vazirani. Um, yeah, you can. Uh, the record, the keynotes were recorded yesterday. Yes, exactly, yeah. yeah um, so all of them are on, um, online on the channel um, on YouTube. Okay. I think they'll be, they'll be online soon. I think. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions before I move on? Okay. Um, so. I'm not going to get into a lot of other quantum gates right now because there are, there are lots of them. Um, there is a, in the QuizKit tutorials repository, which is this really large repository filled with a bunch of Jupyter notebooks that explain all the basics of quantum information theory, a lot of uh, different algorithms, things like Shor's algorithm, which is what everyone is always excited about because of RSA, um, and a lot of other algorithms like Rovers and um, but it also explains fundamentals. There's a notebook in there that um, provides a list of all of the quantum gates that are by, by default available in QuizKit. They're the standard ones. Um, but because it's targeted for people who are familiar with linear algebra, they don't actually show the qubit rotation model. Um, I'm, I use that because I find it a bit easier since my linear algebra is pretty weak. Um, and that's what I'm using here. But um, that's not intuitive for people who aren't super familiar with how this rotating in vector spaces works. Um, so I just put an example here to show how, in code how you can take the gate from that notebook and translate it to the output state on a block sphere. Um, so in this example, I am um, running the Y gate. So I'm building the same quantum circuit from one qubit, one classical bit, and just applying the Y gate. And in this case, I'm using a different simulator called the state vector simulator. So instead of measuring and getting a count to zero or one output, since we're simulating, we can look at the quantum state as a vector um, of the components. So I was showing zero plus one before. You can represent the quantum state as a vector. So that zero and that one have a coefficient in front of them. So if it's at the basis state zero, it's a one coefficient and a zero coefficient. Or if it's pointing anywhere along the surface, you can give it um, its own number as a coefficient, and that will represent its position on the sphere. And the state vector simulator lets you get that, get that state vector instead of measuring. Um, so we use that, and then we use this visualization function, plot block multivector, to plot the output of the, in a, on a block sphere what the output of that operation looks like. And it can be any, any, it can be a full quantum circuit with a lot of different gates or, or just one like we're doing here. Um, so in this case, if we apply the Y gate, it, it will go from a zero or a one because doing a um, 180 degree rotation over the Y axis is the same as doing it over the X if it's pointing straight up because there's no phase. So it just goes up to down. Um, but because there are gates, a lot of gates, that only work on phase, you can't always see anything. If, it be, if you're at the zero basis state and you're rotating this way, like that, like screwing a light bulb, you're not going to see anything because the vector is still going to point up. Um, so you need to put it in superposition with a Hadamard to do it first. So 
I put this example here. This is just called the um, S dagger gate, um, which is that symbol right there. Um, you don't have to worry about the math. I've never actually used it in a practical application. I don't know what it's really used for personally, but um, it's a phase rotation gate, and I just picked it to do that. So in here, you can see we apply a Hadamard before we apply that S dagger, um, and we run this cell, and you can see it goes from, we apply a Hadamard, so it goes from the zero to the plus X state, and then the dagger rotation moves it to that minus Y. Um, and if we run this without that Hadamard, it just points up at zero because we're rotating the phase and there's no phase component. Um, and if you look at that notebook I linked to, you can use this to try to visualize what the gate is going to do and move it around and experiment to see how these operations are modifying the qubit state on the block sphere, if you don't want to think about the matrix multiplication. Um, So the um, next thing I want to talk about, oh, before I do that, are there any other questions? OK. That's, um, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, multi-qubit circuits and gates. In all of the examples before, we were looking at a single qubit and what a single qubit gate um, does to this, the state of that qubit. Um, but to do real computation and to get to what uh, the woman in the front row was talking about before is that's not real data. That's one bit. You get a zero or a one. How can you do anything with one bit? Um, the, so you're going to want to use more than one bit um, to do things. And then there are operation, the real power of quantum computation comes when you start using operations on multiple qubits at the same time. Um, so in this case, we're going to start looking at some operations on larger quantum circuits. So here we're going to make a quantum register with three qubits. And we're going to um, build a circuit with those, with those three qubits. And then we're just going to apply an X gate on the first qubit, and, or the second qubit and the third qubit, because of zero index in Python. And then we draw that circuit. Um, so just like before where we had the three, we, we represent in a quantum circuit um, the qubits with these single lines and gates on them, and it just shows the order of operations. Um, so here you can see we're applying an X gate on qubits two and three and not on, on the first qubit. And when we execute this circuit using the state vector simulator, because we're going to look at that state, we can get a vector output. Um, and this is where the complexity from quantum computation comes from. Because of something called the entanglement principle I was talking about before, and we'll get into in a minute, because it's, we need some more basics to understand it. Um, the complexity grows exponential with the number of qubits. You can't represent the state of a, um, a quantum computer by each component individually, like in a classical computer. You have, in a classical computer, you have zero or one for each bit. In a quantum computer, because of entanglement, they're all coupled. So when you look at the quantum state, it becomes two to the n uh, coefficients in the vector for the quantum state that you have to represent. Um, so here you can see we have all zeros except for the one answer right there. Um, another way to represent that is by plotting the quantum state as a three-dimensional histogram, um, which that is really tiny because of this resolution. I apologize. And you can see the individual um, components, um, so you can see 0, 0 through 1, 1, and you can see we have one answer because it's a deterministic, because we're just applying X gate. So there's two ones and one zero, and that's um, 1, 1, 0, which is this one peak. But these, these peaks are probabilities of being the result. So it's um, just like the, the 2D histogram we were looking at before, but this is three-dimensional because the quantum state grows in complexity. And um, it's also much easier to think of things in the block sphere when it's deterministic like this. So here we can see we have qubit zero at the zero basis state, and we applied the X gate to these two. That's the other way to think about it. This represent, the, the block sphere representation falls apart when we start looking at entanglement, because it's hard to visualize things being correlated but not touching. 
Um, and the only multi-qubit operation I'm going to talk about today is called the CNOT gate, which is the CX. Um, and I had a slide on it, um, this one, which is if the, there are two qubits, it operates on two qubits. One is a control and one is a target. The control is represented by this dot and the target is represented by that plus. And if the control is at a zero, it does nothing on the target. Um, but if the control is at a one, then it flips the coefficients on the target um, or applies an X operation. You can think of this. So if this was at um, zero, the A there would be one and the B there would be zero because it's pointing up. Um, and if, you, if we apply the C naught and the control is at a one state, it'll flip that. So it'll become zero on the zero and one on the one. So you have a, a one on your output. Um, so we can see what a CNOT looks like on a quantum circuit in Quizkit by just um, applying the CX, which is the controlled X gate or the CNOT gate. And we do the same thing. So here we're going to build a quantum circuit with two register or two qubits, um, two classical bits for the measurement. We build that circuit. We're going to measure and we're going to draw it. And you can see here we have. Um, the C naught, which is what we wanted. And then we can simulate with a state vector as before to look at the quantum state. So you, since it's smaller, we have only four components because it's two to the second power in complexity. And we can represent this quantum state as it's going to be zero, zero because everything is at zero. And we can draw the, the 3D histogram and then if we were to, I don't, I did not put a block sphere in here, but it's pretty simple. Everything is at zero. It's pretty uninteresting. Um, but then we can add measurement and get the counts. And you see we get zero every single time. And we can plot the histogram for that because everyone likes that blue 2D histogram. Um, and then we can show when the first qubit, the control, is at one, we apply a C naught. So we draw that circuit. So that X gate is going to put qubit zero at one, at the one basis state right there, and we apply a C naught, so that's going to flip the zero to a one, or so we expect it to. And we can run this through the state vector simulator, get our quantum state, and you can see that coefficient used to be here on zero, on zero, zero, and now it's here on one, one. And we can show that in our on our 3D histogram plot for the quantum state of the whole system. And then we can also do the counts. And we get 1-1 one, one like we expect. Um, and then plot the histogram, because why not? Um, so this is how you start thinking about multi-qubit operations. The, the complexity grows, so thinking about the system as a whole gets more complicated. Um, but we've only looked at the classical operations to try to build this basis for how we're going to look at multi-qubit. Um, the next step is going to look when things get, um, when we start using entanglement and where things start being in superposition states while we're applying these operations to them. And that's where things get more complicated. Um, how much time do I have? Just About 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. Um, so before I move on, because this, the next section is the last one, um, I wanted to make sure there are no more questions uh, before we move on, or if people are able to keep up. Okay, if there's nothing, I'll just move on to the last section, um, which is entanglement. And this is, I struggled to come up with a way to think about this. So, um, like I said before, entanglement is where you have two qubits that are independent, but their output is correlated. So here we're going to build something called a Bell state, which is the typical way, the, the easiest way to put things in an entangled state. So we're going to set up a um, two qubit quantum register and two classical registers. And we're going to build a Bell state, which is you put the first qubit in superposition with the Hadamard, and then you apply a C naught on it to entangle them. 
Um, so one qubit is in superposition. It's in that state where it can be a zero or a one, 50-50 chance, you don't know. And then we apply a CNOT on it, which changes the output of the second one if it's one. Um, and that sets up an entanglement. And then we're going to look at this from a lot of different ways. So we're going to look at the output. This one, this measure IZ, is going to look at the first qubit, um, wh whether it's a zero or a one by itself, not looking at the two qubits together, just the first one. Then we're going to look at the phase or the superposition basis of that second qubit by applying the Hadamard before we measure, which is right there. Then we're going to look at the second qubit the same way on its basis state, and then its phase by applying the Hadamard. And then we look at both qubits together in the basis state. So the first one and the second one, we're going to get a zero or a one on the output. Then we're going to look at the, this, this, this third example here. We're going to get a zero, zero, a zero, one, a one, zero, or a one, one. And then we're going to look at the phase of that again, and we're going to get a zero, zero, a zero, one, a one, zero, or a one, one. And we're going to look at all of these circuits to try to get a grasp on what's going on in this entanglement case. Um, so we build all of those circuits, and then we're just going to draw them to show what they all do. So here, Hadamard, we build that bell state, and then we measure. Here we build that bell state again, then we apply a Hadamard to look at its superposition basis or its phase, and then we measure. And then the next two are the same thing, just the measure is on the other qubit. So, and then same thing. And then we look at both qubits together. So we measure, we put it, set up a bell state, and we measure both of them. And then um, we apply the Hadamard on the after, on the two of them to look at the phase. Um, and then we use the state vector simulator to put all of these together and execute them all. And then we look at the Oh, sorry, we, look, we use the regular simulator, the state vector simulator we use later. I just did that as a shortcut. Um, and we look at the first qubit along its basis state. So we get a 0 or a 1 50% of the time, which is on that first qubit with a Hadamard, which is what we expect. We did that before. We, it's at the plus x. We're not doing anything else, and we get a 0 or a 1. That's what we expect. Um, then we look at its phase, or sorry, we look at the counts just raw, then we look at its phase. And in the same, same way, because it's in a superposition, we get uh, a 0 or a 1 50-50. Which one is this? This is, then we look at the second qubit, same thing, because this is where the entanglement starts to come in. We can't really tell that they're entangled because we're just looking at them individually, but it's in a superposition because we applied that CNOT. So if it's zero, it's zero, and in the other one, it's one. And then we look at its phase, and it's the same thing. And now we look at, this is where the entanglement starts to really become a little bit obvious. So when we look at the two qubits together, we get correlated results. So if the first qubit is a zero, the second qubit is a zero. And if the first qubit is a one, the second qubit is a one. They're always correlated. There's nothing in the middle, which is starting to show there's an entanglement uh, because the output is correlated. And then if we look at the phase, it's also correlated which if you remember the principle I was talking about before, it's they're not touching, they're not interacting, they're not connected. Um, we're just applying the operation to the two of them, at one in a superposition state, and the output becomes correlated. Um, and that's what entanglement is. 
Um, and then we can also look at that three-dimensional histogram as before. And you can see here that we see that same correlation between these corners, which are 0, 0, and 1, 1. And that's the, um, that, that, re that demonstrates that these are correlated. Um, so before I show how this is different from like a classical way, are there any questions on that? I know it's pretty abstract, and I'm trying my best to come up with explaining this without the math. Um, Oh, you can, so um, often you use the CNOTs and the Hadamard to set up an entanglement, and then you perform operations on one or both of the qubits to perform operations. And that's actually like where the power from quantum computing comes in, because you can change one qubit, and because they're correlated, the operation affects the other one. And that's actually like, that's how like quantum Fourier transform and all the big quantum algorithms you expect are, are built. Um, I'm just showing you just the, the basic building blocks. Um, at the end, I um, have a lot of links to more information um, because what I thought was valuable in this presentation, instead of showing you all of these abstract algorithms, was build the building blocks and in the software to show how you can do this at home yourself and try to understand the basics so when you look at those other algorithms, you understand how they're built and maybe play around with them on your own. Um, so the last thing I wanted to show um, in my remaining five minutes um, was how this is different from um, a classical way. So you can build a, a classical system where you always get 0, 0, and 1, 1 as your output, but that's not entangled. Um, and we can build that on a quantum computer pretty easily. So here what I'm doing is I'm just building two quantum circuits with two qubits, two classical bits, and applying X gates on one of them, one of those sets. And then I just measure everything, and you can see I get one where it's just measured, so it's always going to be 0, 0, and one where I apply an x and then measure, so it's going to be 1, 1. And then I can com execute both of them, combine the results, and plot a histogram. And there I get what looks like the same exact thing we were getting before, where, it's 50, where the result is always 0, 0, or 1, 1. Um, but this is not actually correlated. They're just 0, 0, 1, 1. And we can show that by looking at that superposition basis, or the phase, by applying Hadamard. So here we build the same thing up again, and we just apply a Hadamard to the end. So here we have, we apply the Hadamard for the first case where it was just 0, 0. And then we do the same thing again with um, when it's in the 1. So we apply the x, so it's in a 1, and we apply a Hadamard, and we measure. So we're just looking at that, that phase component by applying the Hadamard. And then we do the same thing with the execution. We combine them, and we run it, and we visualize the histogram. And you can see there, the results aren't correlated. When you look at that phase component, they're in individual superpositions, so you get basically an even spread across all of them, which is what, which shows that you can, you can build something that looks like it's entangled classically, but it's not actually entangled. Um, and that's, that's where things get different. Um, so that's all I had in this notebook. I, like I said before, I was trying to build the basic building blocks to give people an understanding of how quantum algorithms are built from these basic things, the, those two key concepts of superposition and entanglement. Um, and the, a lot of the things in this notebook are built off this QuizKit tutorials repository I mentioned before. Um, and there are some other notebooks that continue off where this one, where I built off this one. So these three notebooks here, um, this one goes more into the concept of phase, which I just briefly touched on. I didn't deep dive in on. Um, and then the next one is testing entanglement. So we showed what entanglement is and how it's different from a classical case. Um, this one starts probing it to sh show that it's really entangled um, and show what that correlation can do. And then quantum teleportation and super dense coding starts building off that entanglement to do real things. And it's not teleportation like in Star Trek. It's, it's different. <laughs> um, and 
Um, and then something, um, I have a co oops, I didn't mean to. I have a colleague who gives um, introductory talks that are, um, and he likes to teach through games. So in that Quiz Kit Tutorials repository, there's a directory called games, and it shows a bunch of games built using superposition and entanglement. So it shows how you can actually run these games on the quantum computers and play around with them. Uh, one of them is like Battleship, and there are other things. Um, there are a lot of examples there. Those are fun to play around with locally. Um, and if this was all too dense and you never want to look at this again and you, you hate me for introducing you to weird spheres with rotating vectors and all of that, um, the QuizKit Aqua project is what I mentioned earlier, is designed to give you a Python library that abstracts away quantum algorithms. So it does all of the circuit building underneath and all of the algorithms, there are ones in there for like Shor's algorithm, Grover's algorithm, bernstein valzerani all the big algorithms. And then there are application-specific ones like chemistry, um, machine learning, there's an SVM example in there. Um, and it just gives you a Python library. So you give it data in the format it expects and it gives you the result on the output. And then the last one is there was a paper published very recently that goes into all I was talking about here in more detail with the math to back up. So it shows you the rotations, the math, math and the quiz kit examples. And it's a very good read. And it, it, um, it builds off of where I, where I left off and continues to go because I had to figure out what to talk about in 50 minutes. So I think I'm out of time. But I'm going to be around for the rest of the conference. And if people have any questions, I don't know if we have time for questions now, but um, I'll be around. Thank you. Do you want to just borrow this one? Thank you, Matthew. Anyone? For a question? Do we have the probability of having one question? <laughs> okay, that's, that's fine. Do we have any video tutorials for this one? Video tutorials? Um, yes, I think there are, there are probably, um, I know there is a team at IBM that are... Right now, I don't find anything over there. Okay. thought of running uh, in a classic quantum computing machine or simulator kind of thing, but we could not find any video tutorial or any reference. Okay. I, I don't know of any because I, I taught myself this by looking at the code and all of those notebooks. Okay. Um, but I will ask internally to see if there are people working on it, specifically like the Aqua team, that algorithms project. They have a group of people working on machine learning applications. And the Aqua project, their documentation lists how you can use some of the machine learning algorithms. The one that I've played around with personally is an SVM, which okay. is pretty simple. But it shows how you can do an SVM on a quantum computer uh, using okay. Aqua. Um, and that's in the documentation, but there's no uh, video example I know of. I, I can ask because that's actually good feedback. I can uh, ha have people start work on like video okay. tutorials on these things. Okay, the quantum computing, uh, quantum com processor uh, Q4 or Q2, that is a IBM processor or yes. a, a IBM's processor? Yeah, so those are two of IBM's quantum computers. Um, there are some more. Some are only available to paying customers, but those three that I showed before, those are publicly accessible. So if you follow the instructions in the notebook, you can sign up for an account for free. You don't even need, you can just use your GitHub credentials. And then oh. once you get that token, you can submit jobs to it anytime from anywhere in the world because it's just... But it's we open. need to wait and run. Yes, it's a shared time machine, so you have to wait in a queue. Um, okay. I've been here all week, and the queues have been very short, because I think in America, where most of the people are using them, they're, everyone's asleep. But um, I'm not actually sure why the queues are short. But um, sometimes the queues can be very long. Sometimes they can be very short. And okay. you can look at the queue before you submit, so you can pick which machine you run on. OK. The, where is the simulator code available for the quantum computer processor? Where is the simulator code? Simulator code. Uh, so there is the QuizKit Air project, which I mentioned at the beginning. That's okay. the simulator. You can find that on GitHub. Um, okay. in the QuizKit organization, and it's, uh, oh. it's the, okay. and there's also in QuizKit Terra, there's a Python simulator, but that's more limited because of Python's memory constraints. 
Okay.